Welcome back to this series of embryology lectures. In these lectures, we are going to talk about the development of the uh, arterial system of the body. By the end of this lecture, you are supposed to be able to differentiate between two processes that lead to the formation of blood vessels. These are called vasculogenesis and angiogenesis. You should tell the difference. Second thing is that you should list the primitive arteries of the body, which are called aortic arteries, and describe their fate. The third thing is that you should describe the fate of the branches of the aorta. And lastly, you should discuss the anomalies of the arteries. Blood vessels are formed by two different processes called vasculogenesis and angiogenesis. In vasculogenesis, the mesodermal cells under the influence of vascular endothelial growth factor become differentiated into what's called angiogenic cells. These cells become grouped together to form clusters and later on form elongated cylinders. And uh, the central cells undergo transformation into blood cells while the peripheral cells form the endothelial lining of the blood vessels. Most of the primitive uh, blood vessels of the body are formed by vasculogenesis. Angiogenesis is the formation of blood vessels, new blood vessels from pre-existing blood vessels. That is to say, these are the endothelial tubes. Okay, They give rise to sprouts or buds here and here, and some of these become uh, anastomosic with each other to form uh, communications. Of course, in the case of arteries, these communications are called uh, anastomosis. Well, uh, early in the embryo, we have three sets of aortic arteries. Uh, these include the ventral aortic sac, which comes out from the truncus arteriosus. As you know, this is the heart tube. This is its venous end with the sinus venosus. This is the arterial end with the truncus arteriosus. Uh, from the truncus arteriosus, an extension called the ventral aortic sac extends cranially. And from it, six aortic arches arise in the region of the neck. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. They connect the ventral aortic sac here with one dorsal aorta on each side. So on the left side we have 6 aortic arches and on the right side we have 6 aortic arches. These develop in the region of the neck where gills of the fish are formed for exchange of gases between blood and water. Of course, in human embryo, there are no gills, but we still have these six aortic arches. The two dorsal aorti, that is to say the left and right, fuse together to form one dorsal aorta, and this is very well seen here in an anteroposterior view. Uh, this is the ventral aortic sac here. These are the six aortic arches, okay, on one side, and these are on the other side. And these are the two dorsal aorti fusing together after the neck to form one dorsal aorta. Of course, you know that we don't have six aortic arches on each side, and we don't have ventral aorta and two dorsal aorti. We have one aorta formed of ascending, arch, and descending. So most of these arteries are transformed into something else. What happens is that this appearance of parts of the uh, left arteries that you see here to make this picture. What really disappears? Three parts of the dorsal aorta. One part on each side which connects the third and fourth aortic arches. And another part from the right dorsal aorta between the point of fusion between the right and left dorsal aorta and a branch coming out from the dorsal aorta here called 7th intersegmental artery. There are several intersegmental arteries coming out from those dorsal aorti, 
and from the single united door circuit water. Number seven is very important because it forms the subclavian artery. <coughs> so the three parts that disappear from dorsal aorta are between third and fourth uh, aortic arches and between the point of union and the seventh intersegmental, which will become the future subclavian artery on the right side. In addition, three and a half of the aortic arches disappear. These are number one, number two on both sides, and number five. In addition, the distal half of the sixth aortic arch on the right side disappears as well. So we have one, two, five, and distal part of right six. Well, we'll end up with this picture. Now here we can see that uh, the aortic sac or the ventral aortic sac here becomes divided by extension from the spiral aortic pulmonary septum of the truncus arteriosus, dividing it into a dorsal part here connected to the pulmonary trunk and a ventral part here connected to the ascending aorta. This dorsal part takes with it the six aortic arches of both sides, while this ventral part connected to the ascending aorta becomes divided into two horns, right and left, and from each horn, the third and fourth dorsal aorta uh, become connected. In addition, we see here that from the third aortic arch, a sprout arises here going up. In fact, the third aortic arch is called the carotid arch because it forms the carotid system of arteries on each side. At first, it forms the common carotid till its middle, and from the middle till the dorsal aorta and extending into the dorsal aorta, this is the internal carotid. The ascending carotid develops as a sprout from the common carotid. So the fate of the third arch is similar on the right and left sides. In the case of the sixth arch, let's skip the fourth arch for later. And now we'll talk about the sixth arch. The sixth arch is connected to the pulmonary trunk. From it, a sprout grows down to reach the uh, developing lung bud. Thus, it gives the corresponding pulmonary artery. The distal part of the left side is connected to the dorsal aorta here, and it forms the ductus arteriosus. There is nothing similar on the right side here. As I just said before, this distal part of the sixth arch disappears. So there is no right ductus arteriosus. There is only one ductus arteriosus on the left side. When we come to the fourth arch, we will find out that it differs on the right side from the left side. On the left side here, as you can see, it forms part of the arch of aorta. The aortic arch, the final aortic arch. Okay, while on the right side here, it forms part of the subclavian artery. Both the arch of aorta and the subclavian artery developed from three segments. Well, the three segments of the arch of aorta are, as we just said, the left fourth aortic arch. This is the middle segment. And then before that, there is a segment which is made by the left horn of the ventral aortic sac. And the distal segment is formed by the part of the dorsal aorta from the fourth arch till the seventh intersegmental here. And this part receives the ductus arteriosus. Okay, how about the subclavian artery? Where is it coming from? From three sources. The first source, as we just said here, is from the right fourth arch. The second part is from the right dorsal aorta between the fourth arch and the seventh intersegmental. 
and the rest of the subclavian artery develops from the seventh inter segment. How about the subclavian artery on the left side, which is a branch of the arch of aorta? It comes from the seventh intersegmental directly. Okay. How about the two horns of the aortic sac? What do they form? As we just said, the left horn gives part of the dorsal aorta, while the right horn will form part uh, will form the brachiocephalic or innominate artery. So, if you want to summarize the fate of the six aortic arches, we would say that three of them disappear. The first disappears, but it leaves a very small remnant called the maxillary uh, artery, which is a branch of the external carotid. The second arch disappears, leaving only a small remnant in the middle ear running uh, into the, uh, the stapes, third ossicle of the uh, inner uh, of the middle ear. Therefore, this artery is called stapedial artery. And the third arch on both sides will form the common carotid, and it, its extension will form the internal carotid, and the external carotid arise as a sprout. In the fourth arch, there is a difference between the two sides. On the left side, it forms one of three parts of the aortic arch, and on the right side, it forms one of three parts of the right subclavian artery. Okay, the sixth arch will give the pulmonary artery on both sides, and its distal part that remains on the left side will form the ductus arteriosus. The two horns of the uh, ventral aortic sac, the left one will form part of the arch of aorta, while the right one will form the brachiocephalic or innominate artery. The uh, development of arteries explains why there is a difference between the right and left recurrent laryngeal nerves regarding their course. The left recurrent laryngeal nerve descends into the thorax, where it winds uh, below the arch of aorta, behind the ligamentum arteriosum, to ascend between the trachea and esophagus to reach the larynx, while in the case of the right recurrent laryngeal nerve, it winds below the uh, right subclavian artery to ascend between the trachea and esophagus to reach the larynx. Why there is a difference in the winding level is due to the fate of the aortic arches. As we uh, said before, parts of the aortic arches disappear. Uh, the important part that disappears here is the distal part of the right six aortic arch. The recurrent laryngeal nerve is the nerve of the six pharyngeal arch. Uh, as we just said before, that the pharyngeal arch is developed in the uh, region of the neck. Of course, the pulmonary arteries have to descend into the thorax because they supply the lungs. As they go down, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve has to descend downwards because it winds around the six arch, which here makes the ductus arteriosus. So as the ductus arteriosus and the pulmonary artery descend downwards into the thorax, the recurrent laryngeal nerve has to descend with them on the left side. While in the case of the right side, as the six aortic arch descends downwards, it doesn't have to pull the recurrent laryngeal nerve with it because its distal part disappears here and there is no ductus arteriosus. So it should wind around the fifth aortic arch. There is no fifth aortic arch. It never appears or it disappears uh, very early. So it will wind around the arch above it, which is the fourth aortic arch. And we said that the right uh, uh, fourth aortic arch will form a part of the uh, right subclavian artery. Therefore, the right recurrent laryngeal nerve will wind around the right subclavian artery. After studying the uh, fate of the aortic arches, now we will come to study the fate of the branches of the dorsal aorta. The dorsal aorta gives three types of branches. Here is the dorsal aorta appearing in a cross section of the uh, embryo. Here is the gut 
tube. And this is the uh, intraembryonic mesoderm. These are the somites, intermediate cell mass, and lateral plate mesoderm. And this is the coelomic cavity. Here is the dorsal aorta, which lies ventral to the neural tube and the notochord. It gives three types of branches. The first type is called intersegmental arteries. They run on each side between the uh, somites. As you know, the paraaxial mesoderm is divided into several somites, so the intersegmental arteries run between the somites. Uh, the second type of branches are paired branches to the intermediate cell masses uh, on the right and left side. And these are called lateral splanchnic branches. They supply the intermediate cell mass, that is to say, uh, the developing urogenital system. And the third type is uh, a single, uh, uh, is made of single branches that come from the front or ventral aspect of uh, dorsal aorta. They supply the gut tube. Now we'll see the fate of each type of these three. We will start with the intersegmental arteries. These arteries have the same number as the vertebrae of the body. So we have seven cervical intersegmental, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and five sacral. Two of the intersegmentals become large because they grow into the developing limb buds and form the axial artery of the limb. The seventh cervical intersegmental will form the subclavian, as we said before, and it will continue in the, into the upper limb bud as the axillary and brachial artery. The fifth lumbar intersegmental is also large. It forms the uh, uh, common iliac artery on each side, of course. Well, let's study the other intersegmental arteries. What would they do? In the region of the thorax, abdomen, and pelvis, they will form segmental arteries which are the intercostal arteries, the four lumbar arteries, and the lateral sacral arteries. In the region of the neck, they make something different. We have seven cervical intersegmentals. The seventh will form the subclavian. And here we will see that from each intersegmental, a branch grows down to meet an ascending branch from the next intersegmental. And this is repeated between this one and this one. Descending branch, ascending branch, meeting together. Descending branch, ascending branch, meeting together. Until they finally reach the seventh intersegmental here, these branches that anastomose together will form a longitudinal anastomotic channel. What is the longitudinal artery that runs in the neck? Uh, as you all know, it is the vertebral artery. So the vertebral artery is the remnant of the six intersegmentals, while uh, the intersegmentals themselves will disappear later, leaving only this vertical anastomosis, which mainly forms the vertebral artery. In fact, there are more than one vertical anastomosis. There is the ascending cervical, deep cervical, and there is an anastomosis here which will form the internal thoracic artery, superior epigastric and inferior epigastric. But the most important one that we should remember is the vertebral artery. After the fifth interse lumbar intersegmental forms the uh, common iliac, the remaining of the uh, dorsal aorta becomes narrowed, forming the median sacral artery. So we have seen that the intersegmental arteries will form the arteries of the limbs, the intercostal, subcostal, lumbar, sacral arteries, and a very uh, important longitudinal artery in the neck, which is the vertebral artery. Now we have come to see the fate of the two remaining types of branches of the dorsal aorta, which are the lateral splanchnic arteries and the ventral splanchnic arteries. The lateral splanchnic arteries supply the intermediate cell mass of mesoderm, which will form the urogenital system, that is to say, the suprarenal cortex, the gonads, and the 
kidneys. Of course, you see here that the gonad or test testis or ovary arise high up, while the kidney arises low in the pelvis. And then they will exchange positions. The kidney will ascend and the testis or ovary will descend. So these lateral splanchnic arteries will give the paired branches of the abdominal aorta, which is the inferior phrenic giving the superior suprarenal, the middle suprarenal, the renal, which also gives the inferior suprarenal, the gonadal artery. Now, regarding the ventral splanchnic arteries, we'll talk about the vital line arteries. These supply the gut tube, which is made of foregut, midgut, and hindgut. The foregut is supplied by one artery called the celiac trunk. The midgut is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery, and the hindgut by the inferior mesenteric artery. So these uh, branches are the single branches arising from the front of the abdominal aorta. Now we will come to the fate of the umbilical arteries, which arise from the uh, dorsal aorta and run into the umbilical cord. Uh, there are two, right and left. First, they come out from the distal part of the caudal part of the abdominal aorta, which will later on uh, become narrowed to form the median sacral. Therefore, they change their origin, uh, point of origin, till the uh, common iliac artery. Now we'll come to discuss the congenital anomalies of the arteries. The two uh, common uh, problems of the aorta are uh, called coarchitation of aorta and patent ductus arteriosus. Coarchitation means narrowing of a segment of the aorta, which takes a variable length, maybe a, a very a short constriction or a long segment. Uh, there are two types of coarchitation of aorta. It is either preductal, that is to say before the ductus arteriosus, in, in such case, the ductus arteriosus remains patent, uh, while in the postductal type, which occurs distal to the ductus arteriosus, the ductus typically closes. Uh, uh, coarchitation of the aorta occurs uh, usually due to uh, extension of the ductal tissue into the uh, arch of aorta. Um, when the ductus arteriosus starts to close after birth, also, narrowing occurs in the uh, aorta itself, uh, causing the coarchitation. Uh, the problem with coarchitation is that uh, pressure rises proximal to the uh, narrowing, leading to increased pressure in the three big arteries of the aorta, which supply the head and neck and the upper limbs. Uh, therefore, usually uh, the head is hyperemic uh, together with the upper limbs, while pressure is very low below uh, the ductus, uh, the, the narrowing of the aorta. Uh, therefore, pressure in the lower limb is very poor. Uh, characteristically, in such case, you find a baby with hypertension, uh, especially in the upper part of the body, uh, a very uh, poor femoral pulse or inability to feel the femoral pulse. Uh, you have to notice that hypertension also occurs due to ischemia of the kidneys uh, which will stimulate the renin and angiotensin system. Uh, there is a big risk for such babies to develop intracranial hemorrhage due to high pressure, especially in the cerebral circulation. Uh, in such cases, uh, uh, we treat these cases typically uh, surgically uh, by uh, resection of the narrowed segment and uh, anastomosis of the two parts or maybe grafting of uh, a large uh, segment uh, between the two ends. Um, sometimes the, we revert to balloon angioplasty in which we introduce a catheter, uh, inflate it to uh, dilate this, uh, maybe followed by stenting. Uh, well, the uh, second important anomaly of the aorta is patent ductus arteriosus. As its name implies, it's uh, uh, failure of obliteration of the ductus arteriosus, either an isolated anomaly or uh, secondary to coarchitation of the aorta. 
typically, uh, what uh, causes the ductus arteriosus uh, to close is a diminished uh, level of prostaglandins in the blood. Prostaglandins uh, uh, come mainly from the placenta, and they are typically uh, broken down in the lungs, which are not functioning in the uh, fetus uh, before birth. Uh, therefore, the level of prostaglandins is high, and this keeps the ductus arteriosus patent. After birth, uh, the umbilical cord is tied and the placenta is removed, so there is no more prostaglandins coming uh, to the circulation. In addition, the lungs break down uh, a lot of prostaglandin. In addition, the lungs produce uh, uh, bradykinin, which uh, also causes closure of the ductus arteriosus. Uh, typically, the ductus arteriosus starts to close uh, 12 hours to 24 hours after birth, uh, just by constriction, and then it becomes blocked totally after three weeks. Um, if it doesn't close uh, after that, after three months, there should be uh, an intervention. Uh, typically, it is uh, closed by uh, uh, ligature. Uh, this is surgical intervention. Sometimes it is done through uh, uh, occlusion uh, by a catheter, or uh, there is at first an attempt uh, with medical treatment. Uh, by medical treatment, we uh, uh, use uh, prostaglandin inhibitors such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, maybe endomethacin, uh, and this will help to uh, uh, stimulate the closure of the ductus arteriosus. As we said uh, in the case of coarctation, also uh, patent ductus arteriosus may occur uh, due to uh, uh, genetic or environmental uh, factors. Uh, it is sometimes associated with some uh, genetic anomalies or uh, it may occur due to uh, prematurity. Uh, sometimes it occurs with uh, German uh, measles infection during pregnancy. Now we will come to dis discuss three uh, anomalies of the arch of aorta. The first one is called double aortic arch. Uh, the second one is called right aortic arch. The third one is interrupted aortic arch or abnormal origin of subclavian artery. In the case of double aortic arch, this segment of the right dorsal aorta that was supposed to disappear, that is to say the segment between the seventh intersegmental artery and the union of the two dorsal aorta, remains. In such case, we will see that there are two aortic arches that enclose between them the trachea and esophagus. Uh, forming a, a ring around the trachea of the and the esophagus. In such case, we will see that the uh, 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 subclavian and the common carotid on each side arise from one of these arches. The second anomaly we call it as its name the right aortic arch. It occurs due to disappearance of the left segment of the uh, dorsal aorta that, while the right segment that was supposed to disappear remains. Also, uh, the distal segment of the sixth aortic arch on the left side disappears while it remains forming a ductus arteriosus on the right side. Uh, and here we can see that the arch of aorta is reversed in position. Uh, in the third anomaly here, uh, we see that the fourth aortic arches do not uh, develop, they disappear. In such case, we see that the ascending aorta gives rise to uh, the two common carotid arteries, while uh, the subclavian arteries arise strangely from the left uh, pulmonary artery through the ductus arteriosus. This will make the arch of uh, aorta or replacing the arch of aorta, the ductus arteriosus this part of the dorsal aorta, and from each seventh intersegmental uh, subclavian artery arises. In the, sub, in the case of the right subclavian artery, it typically passes behind the esophagus, causing a type of dysphagia, uh, difficulty in swallowing, called dysphagia uh, lusuria.
Well, uh, to sum up, uh, as we said, there is a difference between vasculogenesis and angiogenesis. Vasculogenesis is a primary process of formation of uh, blood vessels from angioblasts, uh, while angiogenesis is budding off uh, from these uh, primary blood vessels forming uh, branches and anastomosis. Uh, the early aortic arteries were ventral aortic sac, uh, six aortic arches on each side, two dorsal aorti fusing to form one, uh, three aortic arches disappear, leaving the third, six and fourth. The third will form the carotid system, the sixth will form the pulmonary system with the ductus arteriosus on the left side, uh, while the fourth uh, makes uh, something different on the right from the left side. It makes part of the subclavian artery on the right side and part of the aortic arch on the left side. Regarding the branches of aorta, there were intersegmental, lateral splanchnic and ventral splanchnic. The intersegmental will form the limb arteries, the seventh intersegmental for the upper limb, the fifth in lumbar intersegmental for the lower uh, limb. They also form the intercostals, uh, lumbars, uh, lateral sacrals, in addition to the vertebral artery. Lateral splanchnic will make the paired branches of aorta, which supply the urogenital system. Ventral splanchnic will form the uh, uh, arteries that supply the gut, and we discuss the anomalies, uh, five anomalies of the aorta. Uh, thank you so much for kind listening.